I grew up in Birmingham, Michigan. It was a you know very very homogeneous suburb. I was a small town girl, and I wanted to brush the hay seeds off my shoulder. My father was a banker, um, graduate of Harvard and Yale. I grew up here in New York City, in the back of a laundry. We were related to William Brewster of the Mayflower. I was born in Los Angeles. Um, my father was a neurosurgeon. My parents had three small children and uh, absolutely no money. I grew up in, in a family that social historians would call a Brahmin family. I grew up in Port Washington, New York, which is only 15 miles from Barnard. Although in the mid-60s, it was many worlds away. When we first got there, we couldn't wear pants on campus. Uh, we had to have white gloves and hats for tea with the president on Fridays. I don't think I ever went. Keeping our door open when we had male visitors and had to be in by one and got the merits. We went into Barnard in our, you know, skirts that were daringly two inches above the knee. And within months, they were, you know, up to our butts. And the tees were being replaced by uh, marches. Coming to school in the beginning of 1967, it's like we went through uh, sort of 10 years of history in one year. Once I saw Columbia's campus, there, there was no not going there. And my father, in my face, said to me, you will leave this house in one of two ways, in a bridal gown or in a casket. My parents drove me there the first day. I remember I had on an outfit I made because we were all taught how to sew, you know. I arrived with this winter coat that was this orange wool winter coat that was so 50s. I love my parents dearly. I wanted to give them a hug and send them on their way so I could get out and start exploring. I met lots and lots of boys that were just fascinating to me. I met many Jewish boys. I'd never met Jewish boys before. The very first day, there were two women on our floor who were going through their debutante books. And I thought, wow. It was like Cinderella for me. I met some guy and he had already, he was already a hippie. And he asked me to go down to Fillmore East to see a band with him. And I put on this, I think I had like a Lons dress. <laughs> and this orange, uh, this orange coat. And we went down to the Fillmore East and I felt like I was from Mars. Remember in the fall, there was a, a demonstration in Washington, and I wanted to go, but I'd also been invited to a football game. And I had already said I would go to the football game. So I got dressed in jeans to go, only to discover that um, this guy I was going with said, women wear skirts to the football game. So I changed my clothes, I wore this stupid skirt. There was such a culture shock that I think I had something like a nervous breakdown. Leaving home, wearing jeans, wearing pants. I did not own pants. I certainly didn't own jeans. Buying my own clothes, I had never been allowed to do that. I remember a night when there was a combination um, fire drill. I had volunteered to be the fire marshal. You had to put on a fire hat and you had a clipboard and a whistle and you had to go from room to room making sure everybody was there. And Panty Raid, where the Columbia marching band played. So you had the marching band in the courtyard, you had the fire bells ringing, you had the fire marshals running from room to room, and then you had the boys climbing up the ivy, right? It was, it, to me, it was like being in a Marx Brothers movie. 
And I, I thought the whole, my whole life now would be a Marx Brothers movie because it was just so silly and funny and crazy um, the way we thought life would be now that we were at Barnard. I think I felt I would be a virgin until I fell in love. And in a way, I like to think that's what happened. <laughs> but it happened in freshman year. By the middle of my freshman year, I had, with a group of other students, uh, we'd all rented an apartment, and we'd just get stoned out of our brains, and, you know, everybody was sleeping together. So. I was pregnant when I walked in the barn. I don't think I knew it quite yet. So the first thing I had to do was take care of that. And um, that was my first three months. So I didn't do too well that first year. I had an abortion at the end of my freshman year. I was raised a Catholic. I think I was scared for my soul. To me, it was a child, and I was too selfish and too young and too scared to do anything different. This was the absolute right thing uh, for me. In my sister's case, she got pregnant before being married, and that was enormously disappointing to my mother. Uh, and caused a great deal of wrath. So I came in with that kind of baggage, but with the pill. I said, okay, that's not going to happen to me. I got the pill, this is not going to happen to me. I can have some more choices. Um, and I had the advantage of falling in love. It always seemed like anybody you had a relationship with, it was always just about the sex. Being so conservative and so old-fashioned, you know, the first word in my vocabulary when that subject came up was no. What was really going on for me, and I didn't appreciate this until after I left Barnard, was that I'm a lesbian and that my four years at Barnard trying to find the right guy was, I was looking in the wrong direction. I was taking an Italian film course and somebody who was in the film course decided to have an orgy at her apartment. This was because then we were going to see the movie Fellini Satyricon. What the person did was she said, everybody come on over, we're going to have an orgy the night before, we'll really get into the mood of Satyricon. People walked up the steps, opened the door, took off their clothes, <laughs> and walked into the room. So I walked in, took off my clothes, grabbed a guitar, which I don't play, and I covered. <laughs> Martin Luther King was assassinated. And that just sent shockwaves everywhere. Well, the, Columbia was planning to build this gym. The community would have access only through a door that we, re we regarded as the back door. One April day, I went to lunch in the dining room and nobody was there. But I know it was in the middle of the week, and I know I had class in Hamilton Hall. Um, and they said, um, we're on strike, you can't go to class. Some of the people I knew were in the buildings, and some of the people I knew were in the lines around the buildings, and I kind of didn't know what I thought, and I didn't know enough about it, frankly. I mean, I mean, I knew I was opposed to the war. I, I think I knew at the time what the issues were. I just didn't think they had any validity. And I just thought it was, it was just people who were out of control. At some point in the evening, a kind of, um, giddiness came over the crowd because we realized we were in control. I don't think any of the white students understood that uh, basically how much more political experience the black students had had and how much more serious they were. There were balloons and a Mao poster and it had just started to have kind of a, a carnival atmosphere and litter started to accumulate. For the black students, this was not an acceptable thing. We had been raised to, quote, uphold the race. We knew we could count on one another to carry ourselves with dignity. Also, the goals of SDS um, and our goals were starting to s split because SDS wanted to stay in the building until Columbia University severed its connection with the CIA and with defense research. Well, we would have been in the building two years. When I heard that SDS had been asked to leave, I had ambivalent feelings. 
um, somehow that moved against my um, sort of integrationist upbringing. Somehow we should have been able to do this together. First inkling of what was going on was the night that the square on Broadway and 116th Street was stormed by the, the troopers. I remember the watching them bring the ambulances and bringing the police cars and taking people away. And... I'll never forget waking in the night and hearing the screams as people were being clubbed and beaten. And then the next morning, it was a gray, cold gray morning that next morning, and going onto the campus and um, the feeling that something or somebody had died. The Times just really made it seem like not a big thing. The police were not brutal, you know, and I just thought, okay. And that's the beginning of more, you know, being um, really cynical. And we had a discussion. Are we going to resist arrest or are we going to go quietly? If you wanted to leave without getting arrested, you, you went with a group that was going to leave without getting arrested. If you wanted to go quietly to get arrested, you went with that group. If you were going to resist, then you went with that group. Harlem had just exploded over the um, assassination of Martin Luther King. Everyone was walking on eggshells regarding our, our takeover and the support we were getting from the community. Nobody wanted to trigger a, you know, another set of rebellions. So when the police came, they dismantled the the barricade by throwing the furniture at us. Just as we were leaving the last part of the office suite, this cop hit me in the back of the head and really hurt me. So when those officers came in there, um, you know, it was just moving to me. Many of them had tears and it felt as if our older brothers, our cousins, our uncles had come in to take us out. So the rest of my experience before I finally got to uh, the hospital was this concern about how much I was bleeding and how much I was hurt and the excitement of being arrested for something I believed in. And it made me feel strong. It made me feel powerful. It made me feel like there, you can, they never built that gym. After we uh, were released from the tombs where we had been taken, um, we went up to Harlem to um, a public meeting and one other graduate students um, frightened me out of my wits. This was one of our leaders, talked about the person who we uh, characterized as a turncoat. The next time Charles 37X Kenyatta, who was supposed to be a government plant, tries to disrupt one of our demonstrations, we have to isolate him and kill him. Well. Let us say that that was probably the last demonstration, activism, in, in the tangible way that I engaged in. When you started talking about political assassination, that's when I went back to dating. My parents, as I say, were essentially liberal Democrats, really freaked out when I got arrested. And um, laid down some conditions that were not possible. I think that the, the emotional impact of them cutting me off like that was much more devastating than I was consciously aware of, but I certainly went into a tailspin. And my father turned to me and said, Here, I'm not sending you back to Barnard. I'm not going to throw money away for your education if you're not going to be you know, in school attending classes. Something happened one night. My father stormed into my bedroom and he said, I want you out of this house, and I don't know if I ever want you to be a member of this family again. There's a great deal of feeling, anger, frustration, hope, expectation, all swirling around in circles, all at the same time. And that next morning I woke up and I heard a girl screaming down the hall, just screaming in anguish because her brother had just been killed in Vietnam. Well, I knew people in high school who went. My class was only 29 people, and um, one of them was killed. It changed everybody's life. I mean, yeah. everybody was always thinking about how not to get drafted. Um, you know, I remember my brother, my mother taking my brother to something 
to document sleepwalking so that he wouldn't have to go and be drafted? The person that, um, that uh, I became pregnant with, um, he declared that he was homosexual. I remember the night when they read off the birthdays, and uh, I was very concerned that the boy I was dating at the time would have a birthday that was in the danger zone. And I can remember sitting with him in his dormitory at Columbia as we listened, and, and he did not. He was safe. All the young men I knew were terrified of being drafted. Um, and I only knew one guy who really wanted to go. He volunteered and, and actually was killed there. The enemy that we were watching on TV every night and that was killing each other as well as being killed uh, and killing our American soldiers looked like me, looked like us. We didn't want to be scapegoated, you know, the way Japanese Americans were during World War II. I really felt very uncomfortable sometimes and, and feeling that people um, did really see society increasingly in a, a racially uh, polarized way. Um, the, the strike in 1970, uh, I think there was already a lot of concern about the progress of the war. And there were demonstrations all over in colleges and stuff like that. And then when the kids in Kent State got shot, Barnard went on strike again for the second time. I grew to think of spring at Columbia as, you know, okay, you know, pretty soon it's time to quit going to classes and there won't be any final exams. You know, there'll be some kind of chicanery going on in the spring. It was sort of almost like, you know, instead of a maypole and, and may dances, there were, there was unrest. And I remember being really kind of annoyed our senior year but that was the only year that it was quiet, and we had to take exams. I remember thinking that was really unfair. I just feel like there, that we were the beginning of sort of a lost, I mean, time. Who, who goes to college with all that we went through? Started out my first semester, I was on a track to, uh, for medical school, but it all fell apart within, before the, almost before the end of the first semester because there was no guidance, you know, it was just chaos. Everything was chaos. I was so lost. I had no idea. I mean, I, I have kids now who are in college and, and I look at them and I think, you know, somebody let me just wander around like that without anybody sort of saying, hey, can I help you? You want to talk? I mean, it took me years to put this together. When everyone else is graduating, I was graduating by giving birth to my daughter. Barnard, I learned that it can make a difference, that I could make a difference, that people could make a difference, and that is a lesson that I had to learn firsthand. The 60s were freedom, you know, and exploring, and feeling um, intensely about a lot of things. I don't think that my parents' generation, or the administrators of colleges, or high school teachers, uh, were prepared for drugs, the sexual revolution which happened, the, the disaffectedness having to do with the racial issue and the women's issues and the war and all this stuff. We were children. We didn't think we were. We thought we knew everything, but, but we were children.